coming to you live from Pressbox Overtime. Um, I'm excited that I'm finally getting back to doing interviews and shows, et cetera. I got a new platform. This is the first time I've tested it out. So far, so good, because I've been talking to my uh, guest uh, privately before we went live. Uh, so just real quick, um, I do have a Facebook group. It is public. You don't have to join the group. Uh, if you do join it, though, anytime I come on live or do interviews and I'm starting to line up some interviews with some athletes, et cetera, hopefully do a show next week, uh, you'll at least get a notification that I am live. But I'm also doing this on my profile, just so any of those, uh, I forgot how many friends I have, a couple hundred, uh, might want to watch this as well. So without further ado, I want to get started. Um, it is my pleasure as my first guest of this second semester to have Dr. Andrew Ramjet, the Assistant Director for Student Activities, and as we affectionately call him, the County Athletic Director, here to talk about a very important issue that we've been thinking about for years. And finally, somebody's taking the bull by the horns and doing something about it. So let me bring on Dr. Ramjet. Hey, Bill. Hey, what's up, my young friend? How are you today? I am doing a wonderful long day in Vieira today, but I'm happy to be here with you. Well, good. I'm glad to have you. So real quick, for those uh, in the audience or might watch this later, you're in your second year as the Assistant Director for Student Activities and County Athletic Director. And just give us a little bio about, uh, I know you were over in, uh, was it Orange or Osceola working and teaching and, and what you were doing and, and what brought you over? Yeah, so I was out in uh, Orange County. I was a dean over at uh, Lake Nona High School, which is less than a five-minute drive away from the house coaching football there, girls basketball, a little bit of weightlifting. And, um, you know, when was it? July 2020, you know, during the pandemic, just being bored at home, I said, let me look around and see what jobs are available. You know, I have my doctorate in, in ed leadership and I was trying to, you know, move in to more of a district administrative role. And, you know, I, I came across uh, the assistant director of student activities role, which was posted, which was your job before you retired. <laughs> so um, applied out to the job and uh, thankfully was hired. And in these last two years, it's just been just it's just been great. You know, the the, the teachers, the coaches, the athletic directors, the whole community in Brevard has been nothing but wonderful to me. And we've gotten a lot accomplished. We still have a long way to go while I'm here, but I'm, I'm just thankful to be part of the, the BPS community. Well, and I can certainly concur. I've always heard great things about you. I had the pleasure of meeting you uh, before I sailed off into the wild blue yonder. And uh, again, it's just great that Brevard Public Schools, as the 10th largest county in the state, 49th or so in the country, has somebody like you dedicated just for athletics. I know you got a lot of other things on your plate, yeah. uh, but a county <laughs> that big or, or this big needs to have somebody that spearheads that. I think Brevard now with you at the helm, you know, we have a voice at the table when it comes to the other county athletic directors, FHSAA, et cetera. Not that they didn't know who Brevard was, but now we have a face with Brevard Athletics, and I think that's a plus. So you're sitting at home in December uh, on break. Uh, you got two lovely daughters, am I correct, I believe? Two daughters and a son. Two daughters. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, and, and just I want to apologize, just in case one of them happens to barge in. I've told them to stay oh. away from the office, but they don't listen, so they might just run in here. So, apologies. Well, that's okay. And, and if they have any comments, and and for those that are watching, if you type in a comment, I see somebody already has. I'm going to try to read them as I go. Uh, Greg, hey, thanks uh, for joining us. Doug's in the house. Um, and any questions you have for Andrew or even for myself, chat, put them on there. I can actually put them on the screen, et cetera. So you're sitting at home, December, you got this passion burning inside of you and you started, let me make sure I pronounce it, Florida Coalition for Higher Coaching Salaries. And for those of you on Twitter, it's at pay FL coaches. Um, so you started this Twitter, which kind of sounds like a little match. You threw it on a few pieces of wood. And man, that just took off. How did that all work out? Man, it exploded, man. It, it's it's kind of like a, a Mazel Tov cocktail. The thing exploded. <laughs> but um, no, no, it's something that's been on my mind for years when I started coaching uh, back in Broward County about a decade ago. And, you know, you you it's just it just made, never made sense to me that coaches were paid as little as they were paid. And um, 
going into break, uh, a few days before I, I started the Twitter account, put that tweet out, I spoke to a coach in our district. I'm not going to say his name. And um, he was just basically telling me that he was not going to be coming back next school year um, simply because of the fact that on top of coaching, he has to work a second job full time. He's a he's a teacher, has to coach, has to work another 40 hour a week job, disabled wife at home. And he's like, you know, Andrew, I love what I do. I love coaching, but I just can't do it anymore because financially it is. I just can't make it work. And right. I heard those stories and I hear those stories on a weekly basis from the coaches in our district in Brevard. And it breaks my heart. I mean, just this, you know, these past few months, we lost five football coaches, Bill, all that have gone and, you know, for different reasons. Sure. But when you really get to talk to them, finances pay, play a very big part in this. And right. it got to the point of frustration with me where I said, you know what? I think it's time that somebody says something. And um, I started that Twitter account and there was just one follower to the account, which was my own personal account, made the tweet. And within a few days, I mean, we over a thousand likes, 500 reshares. It was 350,000 impressions mean that it was viewed on Twitter 350,000 times. And wow. um, it, it just it just blew up. And one of our and there were multiple websites that actually covered it. Um, they didn't reach. We they just posted their own stories. And one of those websites was Football Scoop, which is probably, you know, one of the biggest, you know, just high school, collegiate, professional football websites there is in this country. They made an article about it, and uh, it was viewed by a former UCLA assistant named James Thompson, who had just recently accepted the job over at Winter Haven High School. James gave me a call and said, brother, we I've been thinking about this for years. And he told me a very, very just, just heartwarming story, Bill, that... Uh, a few years back, he was coaching at Gainesville High School, mm -hmm. took Gainesville High School to a state championship game on a Friday. They lost the game, but on Sunday, he had to travel down to SeaWorld. He's Polynesian descent, and he had to perform in the Polynesian show. Uh, <clears throat> the Polynesian show case. Two days after coaching a team in a state championship game for extra money. Wow. So I heard that and I mean, broke my heart one and two made me realize that this, you know, Coach Thompson was just the perfect person to work with on this and push right. this initiative forward. Um, and, and then and something great that you all did in a very short period of time. So so you go from a tweet to and again, it just tells you the power of social media. You meet this wonderful gentleman and and, and you know what? We all have said it. I know you've said it. I've said it. You know, we don't get into teaching. You know, it was my second career for the money. But there does come a point, especially the way things are going today, where, you know, at some point in time, especially when you're young, you're raising a family, et cetera. Listen, one time at, I didn't have any kids at the time and, and uh, I was in retail with my wife. I think my base salary was twenty five thousand dollars and they wanted me to go to George. And I'm like, I don't want to go to George and say, well, it's a 50 percent increase. I had you hole on the phone within a few seconds. So there, there comes a point when you got to take care of your family. But from there, you put on some elaborate uh, conference over in Tampa within like a two month period, maybe even less. What, what was that about and who all attended that? So, yeah, in my initial conversations with Coach Thompson, uh, we determined to push this initiative forward. We had to first get on board our football coaches in the state because let's let's be honest football funds everything football sure. football is the money maker so sure. we had to get the buy-in from our football coaches uh coach thompson had uh, experience running those nike coach of the year clinics mm -hmm. and he came up with the idea of putting together a clinic at first it was like okay let's get a clinic together and as he started making phone calls as i started reaching out to folks that tweet was just viewed by college coaches. I mean, it was viewed by scouts. So as soon as they found out that we were the ones putting on this clinic, right. they jumped on it. And in 30 day bills, 30, 30 days bill, Billy Napier, Mario Cristobal, Willie Taggart, Adam Fuller, the defensive coordinator at Florida State, Jeff Scott, head, head coach at U, USF, Chip Lindsey, the offensive coordinator, UCF, Pierre Sonatis, the head coach of Florida Memorial. I mean, wow. 
Tom Allen brought his whole staff from Indiana because he was an assistant coach at Armwood High School out there in Hillsboro. So right. it's a it's he brought his whole staff because it was near and dear to his heart. So in 30 wow. days, we were able to put, put together probably the largest gathering of of, co of football coaches ever in Florida. And just to just to put this into perspective, all of these head coaches from our, our colleges and universities in Florida, they've never been in the same room together. We made it happen. Wow. So the amount of buy-in that we have from all around the state, from our colleges, our high school coaches, I mean, it is tremendous. And it was a very successful event. I, I would say for next time, we'll shorten down the time because it was a long 13-hour day for everyone. Right. We wanted to make sure we put as much information out there for our coaches uh, so they could see what we were about. Um, and, and before we go any further, kind of looking at what your next steps are and, and you know, uh, again, as you and I were talking earlier, if, if you haven't been on my Facebook group, Press Box Overtime, I posted a story I found from a few years ago. And it was just one story. Talks about coaching pay football between Florida and Georgia. And again, we're not going to go into all that because that's why we're here. But a couple of things stuck out. And, and, and I think I, I tweeted, you know, they go hand in hand. So Florida, I believe in coaches pay, I'm sorry, teachers pay is 46 out of 50 states. And then head football coach is 37. Um, now, I do want to say this, um, and, 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 and I know we're talking about football, and like Andrew said, you know, that's what drives everything else. But, you know, all coaches, because I don't care if you're coaching tennis, I, I coach lacrosse, um, you know, they all work night and day. Summers are doing conditioning. So, you know, with that football, everything else we want to come up to. But just looking at that one position, when you're 46 in the in the country in teachers pay and 37th, just looking at that one coaching spot, I mean, that says a lot. And, and when you look at the totality, looking at all of the sports, whether it's bowling, swimming and diving, track and field, cross country, Florida ranks 47th out of 50 states. Wow. Terrible. And even that football ranking, Bill, you'd be surprised. Florida's actually dropped since that article uh, from, I believe it was the Jacksonville Times or New Times Jacksonville. Um, right. Since that was yeah. published, Florida's dropped because you have counties like Sarasota County that have cut stipends and cut some. Well, and, and I think I read, and again, I don't want to, but one of the counties, I don't know if it was Sarasota, um, somebody actually froze their coaching supplements for now. Oh, and uh, and if you've been in the district I was in for 19 years, what was it back in the 2005, six, you know, we went five years without anything. So I, I hate to see that comes up again. So you had this great conference. I mean, amazing to have a whole group staff come down from Indiana, you know, so the next thing is going to be, okay, where do you go from here? What, what kind of things are, are you looking at to start moving this, this passion, this focus forward and, and what steps, um, because we, we both know it's a big haul. You got to start somewhere. And, and what are you all looking at short term, long term to, to start moving forward with? So short term, definitely want to build our membership up with the coaches throughout the state and getting the buy in. I mean, we have 67 counties here in Florida. So what we've been doing is uh, we've been deciding different. We've split up Florida into 10 different regions and we have a region no representative for each 10 of the regions and it's their okay. job to uh no one no one's paid for doing this by the way we're all doing this at the goodness of our heart i want to mm -hmm. just put that out there first but um we're all going to be reaching out to different coaches different schools and getting that buy-in from um yeah. the coaches to have them join the florida coaches coalition um and and from there you know uh our next steps are possible litigation we've mm -hmm. spoken with several lawyers. Um, there will be some announcements coming about that in the next few weeks as far as that, but that's the main thing. I know there have been, from a lot of folks that we've spoken to, we've spoken to legislatures in, in the state, we've spoken to local representatives, and they said, well, you know, the state is handicapped by how much money they can allot to schools. Schools receive money simply based on student enrollment. So that FTE money that schools get, and, and for those watching at home that don't know FTE, it's essentially, 
it's it's called full time equivalent. So schools are paid by FTE, the number of students that are in seats. So with that money, you know, school districts allocate the funding to different areas. There's pressing needs such as curriculum, instructional salary, facilities, especially in your older school districts like Brevard. So your school districts have to allocate that money into those different areas. So school districts, all, they, you know, they all prioritize coaching supplements differently. That's why what one coach may make in Brevard, a coach in Broward County may make less or a coach in Collier County might make more. It's based on that individual school district. So what we're trying to do is uh, find a way to essentially get that number up for, for all coaches. Good. And, and so, and that's a great point, you know, 67 counties. Um, and, and again, just to reiterate for some who may not be as versed with school district and how things work, um, as you and I know, and, and I know uh, uh, Greg and Doug who are watching uh, um, both coaches, the, you know, that supplement is tied to a contract that the districts have with their union. So um, nothing goes when it has to do with HR unless it's in that contract. And, you know, so that's and, one thing, too. And I'm sorry I interrupt there. I know, I know you just mentioned union. And uh, we actually had a call with the AFL-CIO last week. And they gave us the thumbs up. So the, the thinking was always that you could only be part of one union. That's what we perceive. But however, you can be part of two unions at the same time. So while you have your instructional staff that are part of, and I'll use this as an example, are part of BFT also as, you, you know, they, they coach and they're instructional. So they're with BFT. They right. e essentially, we could have a Florida coaches union and they could be members of that as well. And, and one thing, you know, I think unions do a wonderful job of advocating for the rights of teachers. However, they're teacher unions. They're meant to fight for teachers, not for coaches. So right. I think coaches in the state, they need their own outlet to fight for their employment rights. So that's a possibility with a union. And, and uh, I think I put this on my Twitter account um, as well as a Facebook page. For those of you that are interested, whether you work for the district or not, um, it is a public document. You can go onto the district website, click on departments. From there, click on labor relations. And then you click on bargaining info, BFT contract, and around page 67, you can see all the supplement pays, and not just for coaches too, they have them for uh, activity teachers, um, like National Honor Society, band directors, et cetera. But you can see right there exactly what they pay. Um, and just like Andrew said, you know, it is something that has to be negotiated. And I certainly don't wanna speak for any other groups. Um, I don't know in the last six years what covers my and your, um, experience in this position in the position you're in i don't know of that topic i know we've discussed it before just like you put out on your page i think you compared a couple counties um you know i had done the same thing um i i think it's a hot topic i don't know where it fits though like you said and i'll just throw it out there we have uh what is it ten thousand five thousand teachers you know probably a thousand coaches I, I get it. I don't know where that falls in, but at some point in time, uh, because we're not just losing good coaches, they're good teachers too. And, and speaking specifically about Brevard County, where there is an issue, 80% of our coaches are community coaches, right? They're not instructional, you know, instructional staff. So the priority becomes even less at that point because you're not dealing with instructionals, you're dealing with community coaches, which I think is a travesty because as, as you've said before here on the show, our community coaches play such a vital role right. in our schools and in our athletic programs. Right. So, you know, I think, you know, it's time for all districts to realize the importance of coaches. Right. And, 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 and you got to remember too, um, and I apologize. What was the percentage that you said? Uh, in, in Brevard, we're a little over 80%. We're at 82% now, Bill, as far as community coaches and only 18%. It's, it's, and Bill, I'm telling you, on a weekly wow. basis, that wow. number of instructional staff members, I mean, it's, it's sad. 
And the sad wow. reality, the sad reality, Bill, is they can go get a part-time job working the same amount of hours they would coaching and they would make far more money because bill let's face it the, the passion is there for the kids but when you see gas prices going up to four dollars and 20 cents you go to do groceries and you see those prices jacked up you will kind of have to draw the line of importance and priority in your life so i don't right. blame anyone for stepping back and, and I agree 100 um, percent, because even though I was an assistant coach at Satellite High, I was in the system. I didn't work at the high school, so I might have been labeled as a community coach. I don't know. And, and, and I just want to reinforce what you just said. That is a vital piece of what we do. And you got to remember, those people that are community coaches might be, you know, living the dream like I am, retired, still taken out every afternoon during the season, weekends, summer conditioning or. They might work full time and still rushing to get to Rockledge High, O'Galley, Bayside, whatever. So, again, that that's a lot that they also sacrifice to do that. I can remember back whenever it was 10, 11 years ago when, you know, looking at labor costs, et cetera. One of the things and I still say today and when they used to ask me when I was a school administrator, if there was one thing we could give back to the teachers, what would it be? I said that second planning period when we took away that second planning period. And, and went down to one planning period instead of two, that's when no more intramurals at middle school. A lot of coaches didn't want to coach again because now they didn't have the time to do so. So I, I as you know, time and money go hand in hand. And I saw a huge drop in just at the schools that I was working at when we took that planning period that people just didn't want to also add that coaching. Uh, and I think that that hurt us um when we went through that stage as well no absolutely and you know on, on top of time i know planning periods essential but it, it really you know you know it all really boils down to the amount of money that they're paid and you know the florida coaches coalition what we are actually pushing for is minimum wage pay coaches yeah. minimum wage if you paid every coach in this state minimum wage for the hours that they worked i guarantee you guarantee you everyone will be happy and you won't hear a single thing because right now bill if you calculate out the amount of money that coaches make we calculated out based on broward county i used to be in broward so we used it as in our example a head football coach on a yearly basis and you could check the twitter we have the the, the graphic up there they were 2180 hours so 2180 hours on a yearly basis and based on their supplement bill it came out to a dollar 39 an hour Wow. Please tell me what other job in this country you are expected to make a dollar thirty nine an hour. Even waiters and waitresses, their base salary before tip, they get paid much more than that, almost right. triple. That. And we expect our coaches to work for that. It just right. does not add up. It makes no sense. And, and being an ex retail guy, let me just remind everybody: two thousand and eighty hours is full-time that's 40 hour week and 52 weeks so you just talked about a whole nother full-time job i want to make sure i didn't miss anything is there any do you have anything else out there other than your twitter is there a website is there anything else or is, is that twitter that pay fl coaches the main one that you're utilizing right now so well, myself when i started off the twitter i did the pay fl coaches when i linked up with coach thompson um he started one for the coalition and the clinic and that's at FL underscore coaches. So FL underscore coaches. Uh, we okay. plan on synchronizing both of the Twitters. Uh, so the information that's released is, is um, basically the Florida Coaches Coalition. So we're no longer the Florida Coach, uh, Coalition for higher coaching salaries. We're just the Florida Coaches Coalition, the FCC. So I've got, I've got a couple of things that you and I have talked about a little bit on some things I read in that article. What little ideas are, are running through the group as far as, OK, this is what we want. These are some of the hurdles that we have to go across. You got to think outside the box. Are you tossing around other things other than because it may not happen anytime soon, as you and I know, unfortunately, um, raising salaries? What else can we do with coaches? What are some of the other areas doing creatively to maybe solve that same dilemma? Well, really, it's it's quite unfortunate. I know this has been a topic that's been debated for decades. I know coaches have tried, you know, lobbying their teacher unions, lobbying their labor relations within, 
their individual school districts and nothing has worked. You know, it's always falling on deaf ears, Bill. So mm -hmm. I think the the only path moving forward, myself and Coach Thompson determined, is going litigation school district by school district, all 67, the Florida Coaches Coalition, uh, plus the members of those school districts that want to get onto the litigation and approaching it that way. Because and I hate to say this, especially, you know, being currently employed by a school district, and hopefully I'll still be employed after this interview, but the only way that school districts move forward on these things is if you bring that litigation. That's the only way they act. You could have 50 coaches show up to a school board meeting tomorrow saying we deserve better pay, which they do, but they could be there at those school board meetings and it will fall on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have school districts, Bill, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but it's okay. You know, at the end of the year, they always find that money to give these teachers that $1,000 or $2,000 bonus at the end of the school year. Why not put that money back into the salary of those teachers or those coaches? It, it just makes no sense. So the argument that we don't have any money, I don't buy it for one minute. So part of what we're going to be doing, the Florida Coaches Coalition, is in, in time when that litigation is filed, is try to get those financial documents from the school districts. So, right. I mean, it's, 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 I think, our only path forward. And myself, Coach Thompson, we've sat down, talked about this. And I, this is something, Bill, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a little bit of a book nerd. I'm not going to lie. It's something that I've been studying for years, something that I've done my own research on. And right. when we've gone and we've met with the different law firms and I've presented them with that data, their mouth hits the ground. Right. So right. the, amount, the amount of information we have and the momentum that we have built up, Bill, I, I am confident enough to say by this time next year, I'm confident we will see changes throughout the state. Wow. A, a couple of things that I want to throw out there, too, um, and, and I read in this article that, you like you say, and this was a, a, maybe a couple of years ago, um, out of 67 counties, it talked about only 13 counties, Brevard's not one of them, that pays a separate and again we're just talking about football right now but but as uh andrew uh said earlier and, and i concur with you know that that's gonna bring all the coaches salaries up but that's the big one and uh so we're, we're certainly talking about all of coaches salaries but in just talking about football only 13 count counties pay a separate supplement for spring everybody else is included um 12 counties, including Brevard Public Schools, have two lanes, which means they have a, 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 a supplement for new coaches and then another supplement, which for Brevard, I think it's still the same, six plus years, you go to another lane, so you get a little bit more. We are one of those counties. And then 17 counties, also including Brevard Public Schools, and I, I do want to touch on this for a second, do pay extra for playoffs. So 50 counties in the state of Florida do not pay anything. And let's look at Cocoa High School. What? They had four games. Merritt Island, four games. Merritt Island might have had five because Cocoa was in the 4A. So in some other counties, those that coaching staff got paid nothing extra for working five extra weeks. Our head football coaches for making one playoff game, which is a week's worth of work, make $143. But at least we're one of 17 counties that does that. So it kind of gives you a little you know idea. What the, you know what the sad thing is, Bill? These coaches are making no money, but when these school districts win these state championships, they'll put it on their social media. They'll put up pictures. Yay, our school won this championship. But guess what? These coaches still get paid nothing. You know, and, you know, I, I didn't get a chance to touch on this earlier. And it, it's this cause is something that's near and dear to my heart. I had to... My passion was always coaching football, Bill. And, mm -hmm. you know, there came a point, this was 2000 and uh, the conclusion of the 2018 season, excuse me, conclusion of the 2019 season, going into 2020, I have three young kids and I was making $1,800 in my supplement as an assistant football coach. I was out there lining the field. I was out there studying film. I was away from home hours and hours. I, I want to say it was close to about 50 hours a week during during uh, football season. And it came a point my wife basically told me is it's just not worth it. I'm here with the yeah. kids. You're right. out there doing that and you're making next to nothing doing it. It's right. not fair to me. And, right. you know, 
it I I I, I have to agree with her, you know, when right. you know, when when you know you have a mom at home with three kids while you're out there coaching, you're not making money, it's it's gonna drive problems in your marriage and in your relationship. And I was there. So okay. You know, when and I had to leave coaching because of that. So I know there's so many other coaches, not just in Brevard, but in the state that are suffering from the same thing. And, right. you know, there's no one that's out there that's vocalizing this, that's saying this out loud. From my conversations with different coaches, athletic directors, a lot of folks are afraid of retaliation against them for being able to go out and say these sure. things publicly. And I think that's a reason why not so many folks have been able to say that. But two things, thankfully, I work in Brevard County, and if you follow the news and you follow this whole mask thing that's been going on over the last year, you're allowed to have an opinion in Brevard, which is great. Yeah, yeah. So I'm thankful for that. And and two, I'm, I'm I, I somebody has to do something about it. So myself, Coach Thompson, you know, we said we're going to put it all on the line here, and we we want we want to bring this to the forefront. Good. Um, I do want to recognize Gary Schifrin is watching and I posted up. Uh, I want to finish what his comment has because um, uh, it all doesn't fit on the screen. And um, he applauds our new athletic director uh, for his movement and wish him and his coalition the best of luck. Uh, and certainly if he can be of any help, um, ask him. And if you don't know Mr. Schifrin, uh, same on you. Uh, he was a past principal at Merritt Island High School. Go Mustangs. Also for a long period of time the uh, commissioner of the Cape Coast Conference, uh, which before we came up with the athletic director uh, position, that's who ran the Cape Coast Conference and worked with the athletic directors, et cetera. So I certainly do appreciate um, Gary being on board. I see uh, Mr. Tony Hines, past principal, very big supporter of athletics from Rockledge High School has joined us as well. And, and I'll say something, Bill, you know, guys like Gary, like yourself, guys like Jeff McLean, Greg Claiborne that's still around. Those guys helped pave the way for me to be able to do things like that. The, the guys that put that work in in our county to make our county as great as it is in terms of athletics, you know, they, you guys are the ones that empower me to do these kinds of things. So whenever I can salute you guys and give you guys your flowers, I, I gladly do so. So thank you to all you gentlemen that are on here. Thank you to you, Bill, for all that you did for the county. And I'm just trying to follow in your footsteps and pushing things forward. Well, you're doing a great job. And, and, and again, you know, like you say, I agree. I grew up in Brevard County. My dad's a retired teacher, raised two kids in the school district, both athletes. And uh, I do believe in my heart, too. We have a county where you can voice your opinion. You can say something. And without worrying about, you know, reparations and, and what may happen, because let's face it, you know, discussion is the only thing that that helps us move things forward. Um, and a, cu a couple of things uh, that I read in the article I'm going to throw by you. Uh, Clay County, I saw one thing they do with their, their coaches is they make them 11 month employees because we all know they're working 11 or 12 months too. Again, everything boils down to money. I, I, I like that idea. I think some other counties um, give them an extra planning period. But with that, let's say Bill Maharis, uh, you know, football coach at, uh, you know, whatever, Lexington High School um where my dad went to school and maybe i only teach five classes two planning periods but i do lunch duty i do morning duty i do bus duty so again the school is still getting a benefit you know from my work um i like that idea i also like um some of them were talking about indexing and basically what that meant is and this might have been some of the counties in georgia where per the contract they tie the supplements to the salaries so let's say teachers got a two and a half percent raise that year. The supplements go up as well. Everything goes up together. I really like that idea because now I, you're not separating it. So I, I, those are just a couple of things that uh, I read. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are. I think that's a great idea that just the concept of tying supplements directly to to um, the salaries. But when you do that, you you tend to neglect those community coaches, especially in a in a county like Brevard, where 82 percent of our coaches are community coaches. They wouldn't benefit from something like that. So I think there needs to be something concrete as far as this is X amount of money that you're making. And it has to be equitable across the board for all sports. Right. And I'm not I'll, I'll put it out there. I'm not a big fan of that lane thing because. Mm -hmm. 
let's face it, a lot of coaches won't make it to year six because they get frustrated after year one or two with what they're making, right? right. So right. I, I would like to see all coaches paid the same thing, you know. Right. And I think I and I think which I is minimum wage, <laughs> right? Only twelve counties out of sixty-seven actually have that lane thing. The last thing I read, and and being on past booster clubs, um, I was with Rockledge High School when my son played football, and uh, we went through the process of getting the five hundred one C three, and um, you know somebody mentioned in that article about booster clubs helping out. You got to kind of be careful with that. I know if I remember correctly, back in the day, salary, you know, you can't do anything for salary. I, I think maybe you could pay for play, pay for clinics. Maybe you give them a gas card. And I think those are great ideas. Um, me personally, and I certainly want your input. It, it's kind of a Band-Aid on the big picture. I think you and the coalition is looking at. Absolutely. And I, I'll tell you, Bill, we've spoken to numerous coaches, won't say names, that have come forward to say that they're, they had, they do get paid from those booster clubs, believe it or not. There's sure. ways of 5013Cs to write checks in certain formats that can be deposited into someone's account. So yeah. you actually do have some schools that, you know, that, that some booster clubs that do that. And you know, I don't blame the coaches for accepting those funds, you know, to be honest right. with you. But I, what, what I want to see is a level playing field where right. everyone's paid the same thing, regardless of having a booster club or not. We have some schools and not saying that all booster clubs do that, but some schools don't have the privilege of having right. big booster clubs simply based on the community that they're based out of. Right. 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 So I, I want to see things to be equitable across the board, you know, for all school districts, not just our schools in Brevard, but all throughout the state. Let me ask you uh, one other quick thing, and then I'll certainly wrap it up and anything you can tell us on how we, we can we can help. And again, I appreciate the people that listen. Hopefully we'll get some more to watch this later on. Um, you know, one thing I just thought of that I, I hadn't thought of before, and I'm not sure if you all looked into it or addressed it. Big difference in the state of Florida in private schools and supplements that they pay compared to public schools. Do you know, have you looked at that? I'm just curious. Uh, we've spoken to numerous private school coaches and athletic directors and, you know, private schools, they don't have to disclose what their coaches make. Yeah, right. You so, know, uh, and I, I have a buddy out there that coached over at uh, American Heritage yeah. out there in Plantation. Now he's on the Dolphins coaching staff as of a few weeks wow. ago, and he was making some good money, Bill, for a right. uh, high school football coach that rivals what they make out there in Texas. <laughs> well, so, and, and, yeah, and that could be another show, but, but, but I, I know I hear both, you know, well, you know, private school is not really a big difference. Well, you know, I remember back when uh, a couple of years ago, when, when, when COVID came across and the FHSAA, you know, and a lot of the county athletic directors were hoping that they gave us a little bit more direction um, as far as everybody starting at the same time, practicing during the summer, et cetera. And they kind of left it up to us and most counties like Brevard. And I think it was the right call decided that, you know, not to do any practicing right then until we got all of our, you know, our, our ducks in a row and all the protocols, private schools, they were practicing like crazy. I know you're from down in, in Broward County. They didn't have to go by the same parameters 16 high schools in Brevard do. So yeah, it, it's a little different. Um, and, and don't even, we won't even get into how we get players, but just in the parameters they have to follow. They don't have to Holy Trinity MCC, great schools, great programs. Don't have to follow Brevard public school parameters don't have to follow what we pay our coaches. So, so there, there are some things that whether it's pay or just flexibility that, that they can do differently. Absolutely. And, you know, um, and one thing that we're hampered by bill is, you know, I've sat in on a, quite a few of these football interviews, these head coaching interviews, and there are a lot of candidates from out of state that, you know, sit in on these interviews and before they get told what the possible pay is, a lot of them don't know, they expect it to be just as high as where they're coming from. But one thing that they always ask for is, you know, um, I want to bring a staff with me and I need X amount of positions within the school. I need two PE positions. I need a, you know, a peer counseling, whatever it is, right? right. Whatever our schools can't offer that. No, so. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and, and, and not to jump the boat and, and I know you and I differ on our favorite college team, uh, you being a Nola, me being a Gator, 
But that was one thing Billy Napier did. He said, you know, before we do recruiting, I have to get my coaching staff in place. So that just tells you the importance of building, rebuilding, maintaining a program is, you know, get those pieces in place and then go look for your players. So so in closing, and, and certainly anything that you tweet, certainly copy uh, Pressbox over time so that I can share it. Um, to the listeners that we've had, and again, I appreciate Tony and uh, uh, Gary. I saw Doug and uh, Greg on here. Um, what can we do? What can coaches or athletic directors do that might be watching this either now or later that 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 want to join the cause and 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 make the voice even louder? Yeah, to to make the cause louder, uh, go to flcoaches.com. Uh, you can sign up for the membership of the Florida Coaches Coalition. Um, and, and trust me, I don't want to give away too much information because we're going to be rolling sure. things out, but there, there will be major announcements being made over the course of the next few weeks. And if you haven't heard about us by then, you definitely will hear about us by then. And, you know, it definitely involves a lot of media coverage that will be coming to this issue. And, um, you know, I look forward to it, but for more information again on Twitter, uh, at pay FL coaches and at FL underscore coaches to follow okay. our initiative, our movement. And, you know, again, you know, I, I really want to thank everyone out there that has sat through and listened tonight and mainly want to thank you, Bill, you know, for being such an advocate for our coaches, not just in Brevard, but throughout the state. And, and just thank you for having me on tonight. Well, you know, again, it's, uh, you know, my dad was a coach um, and I didn't even find out until after he passed when I was going through some stuff uh up in virginia that he actually used to coach baseball and if you look at my press box overtime uh group which again it's a public group you don't have to join if you do join at least you get notifications when we have these great people on and and like i always say we have great people like andrew doing great things um but i know how much he loved coaching you know i i it was funny you know when i had kids you know all of a sudden the first time your kids say dad you know how emotional that is and i know you've gone through it and I remember when I went back into coaching uh, 10 or so years ago to uh, I was blessed to be an assistant coach at Satellite with the girls lacrosse team. And the first time I heard somebody say coach that I hadn't heard in probably 10 years, I, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps now. And, and, and we, we, we I know we were going to remember our favorite teachers and, and the mentors that we had. Um, but there's just that special bond, whether it's on the tennis court, the lacrosse field, the wrestling mat. Uh, I know when my son comes back into town who proudly serves in the Air Force, hey, I want to run by Rockledge High School. And, you know, it's Coach Renault's, you know, still there that's, that's doing wrestling, Miss Scarborough, who's still doing track. Um, they're special people. They're not just coaches. They're, they're, they're teachers, community people, mentors. And um, it's just a big part of secondary life. And we certainly want to make sure, and we certainly appreciate appreciate here on Pressbox Overtime the work that you're doing. I will continue to uh, re retweet and uh, share all the great things that you're doing. And, and I, I hope any of people watching now or later join the coalition, join the Twitter feed for both of those that you gave out, and I'll send those out as well. And again, my friend, I appreciate your time tonight. Best of luck uh, on the endeavors. I hope you get some time off during spring break. And I'm just a text away, anything that you need, my friend. I appreciate you, Bill, as always. Thank you, my friend. All right. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And thanks for watching on Press Box Overtime. We'll see you again.